Good evening, everyone. Uh, happy Sabbath. I know some people are in other countries where it's in the morning. And so welcome to the study. We're going to continue with Jones 1895 General Conference Bulletins. This is number 11. And um, uh, Jones now is going to start moving into a more uh, controversial aspect of righteousness by faith, which the church does not accept. Actually, I, I find very few Adventists who understand this point that he's going to make. Um, but uh, before we begin this study, can we uh, all pray together? <clears throat> Your gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the Sabbath, uh, for this long and difficult week, for the trials that you place before us, and for the gift of thy son, and for the fellowship of his sufferings. We pray for those around the world who are facing difficulties, some that I've never uh, ever faced. Um, but we know, Lord, that each one of us faces trials um, that cause us to depend upon you and we just pray, Lord, that you can bless each person. Um, I pray for a uh, camp meeting coming up not long from now. And Lord, you know the purposes and plans of all things that are in your hands. And so we just trust that you know what is best. And we pray for this study this evening, Lord. We ask that your Holy Spirit can speak to our hearts that we can see things in your word that are clear, are convicting, and empower us to live a Christian life. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good evening again, and welcome to this evening's study. Uh, so we're starting a half an hour late, um, so we're going to have a shorter study. At least I'm going to try to get through this. Uh, by 8.30, because usually I like to finish no later than 8.30 my time here. Um, so this study here from the 1895 General Conference Bulletin, A.T. Jones, is now moving into uh, a deeper aspect of his study, and he's going to, so we're just going to read and follow through. I'll make occasional comments. Of course, if people have comments or questions, feel free. Um, to ask them or to make those comments um, because we're trying to understand these things. So Jones begins, we shall begin this lesson with the verse we were studying last night, James 4.4. 4. So James 4.4, 4, um, we should all be familiar with, with uh, this verse. <clears throat> And this is where he talks about uh, a friend and an enemy of God, or a friend of this world is an enemy of God. And he's going he's gonna to add on to that. But it's the verse that says, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God, whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And he's going to expand on that. <clears throat> And I desire especially that everyone should look at the verses himself and study carefully what they say. In the times in which we are and the place to which we have been brought by the evidences that we cannot avoid and against which it is impossible uh, to shut our eyes. I know that I never entered upon a Bible study in my life as I do upon this one tonight. So when He's talking about um, the times in which we are. So what time does Job, James, not James, uh, A.T. Jones believe that he is? What, what, where is he in history? He's at the Sunday Law, right? So we've studied this from 1893 and 1895. Jones believes that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 has come down. In his time, and Ellen White seems to endorse what's going on, what Jones is presenting 
1893 and in 1895, that they're in the time of the Sunday law, right? So there's a parallel in this history with our history. <clears throat> so, so that's the, uh, the times in which we are. Now, the place to which we have been brought means that not only are we in those times, but we have been moving through a line, through these way marks, and we're, we're at a certain point in history, and we're brought there by evidences that we cannot avoid. So in this movement, we have gone through an experience that we cannot avoid, and, and against which it is impossible to shut our eyes. Now, that may be true. I mean, it should be true. But many people are shutting their eyes. Many people are rejecting the evidences. But part of that is that we don't know God. And, with, and just because we're in this line, without the knowledge that's here in this presentation that Jones presents and all through these presentations, understanding the gospel, and not understanding it intellectually, or intellectually, but also experientially. That is, we have to experience this gospel. We have to understand. We have to know. So Jones is entering this study here with the knowledge that we should have. We should have the same uh, focus and intensity that Jones has. And he says, I desire that all shall surrender every faculty to the guidance of God's spirit with the whole spirit surrender to God that he himself may lead us where he wants us to go. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. We wish to notice particularly the question, Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? It follows, therefore, that the only possibility of any soul in this world ever being separated from this world and thus from Babylon is to have that enmity destroyed. For I say again, the friendship of the world is not at enmity with God. If it were, it could be reconciled to God by taking away that which had put it at enmity with God. But it is not that. It is the thing itself. It is enmity, and that enmity against God, that which is enmity with God, puts us at enmity with him. Men may be reconciled to God by having the enmity taken away, but the enmity itself can never be reconciled to God. And mankind, whom the enmity puts at enmity with God, are reconciled to God merely by taking away the enmity itself. Now, this is a, a major problem with Adventism because we somehow believe that, that the world is just at enmity with us and that somehow if we can be reconciled to the world, we can win the world. But the world is, at, is enmity. It is not at enmity, if you understand what, what I'm saying and what Jones is saying here. We have the key to the whole situation in the fact that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. The friendship of the world and the enmity are identical. A man cannot have the enmity without the friendship of the world, for that is it. The friendship of the world is in it. And so we believe that we can be friends with the world, that we can have the friendship of the world as a means to try to win the world, win the world to Christ. But, but the world, the friendship of the world, is at enmity with Christ. Yes, so we're in the world, but not of the world. Right. And, and we need to understand this enmity, that it's in us as well, that we are adulterers and adulteresses. Therefore, I say yet again, the only hope of a man's being separated from the world, as the scriptures demand, and as our times demand, as never before in the world, if there could be any difference, is by having that enmity taken away. And that is all we are to seek for. 
that is all there is to be done. For when that is gone, we are free. In the eighth chapter of Romans, the same thing is referred to beginning with the seventh verse. Because the carnal mind, or as it is literally in Greek, the mind of the flesh, is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. That makes emphatic the thought presented in connection with the other text, that there is no possibility of that enmity being reconciled to God. Nothing can be done with it but to take it away, to destroy it. Nothing can be done for it at all. Something may be done with it, but nothing can be done for it. And for the reason that it is against God, it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. It cannot be subjected to the law of God. God himself cannot make the carnal mind, the mind of the flesh, subject to his law. It cannot be done. This is not speaking with any irreverence toward the Lord or limiting his power, but it cannot be done. God can destroy the wicked thing and all that ever brought it in or brought it, but he cannot do anything for it to reform it or make it better. So we have um, uh, this quote here uh, in the chat there. Uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 to 21. Um, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they, they might be manifest that they were not all of us. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Um, and then actually more that goes on in verse 22. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus, Christ, Jesus is the Christ? He is the Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Right. Now John goes on a lot about this, what it means. But the Antichrist is, is a belief that the spirit of the Antichrist is the idea that Jesus has not come in the flesh. So that's the spirit of Antichrist. And so we need to understand that because Jesus came in the flesh. And so Jones is, is going to give us a very good study on these points. So um, the carnal mind, the mind of the flesh, cannot be reformed, right? So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. And uh, just hold on a sec. Um, yet this world is of the flesh altogether, but ye are not of the world. For, for I, says the Lord, have chosen you out of the world. He has separated the Christian from the flesh, from the ways of the flesh, from the mind of the flesh, and from the rule of the flesh. This separates from the world by separating us from that which of itself holds us to the world. Nothing but the power of God can do that. Now let us trace a few moments the record of time, of the time when God made man. In Genesis 2, when God made man, God himself pronounced him with all the other things he had made, not simply good, but very good. Then man, the first Adam, Adam as he was, was glad to hear the voice of God. He delighted in his presence. His whole being responded joyfully to his call. But there came another one into the garden and cast distrust of God into the minds of these. The serpent said unto the woman, hmm, 
Has God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? She said, you may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden. God said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. The serpent said, ye shall not surely die. For God doth not, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, ye shall be as God, knowing good and evil. That is the Hebrew of it and the Jews translation of it also, and the revised version, if I remember correctly. The insinuation was to this effect. God himself knows that that is not so. And he knows that it is not so that he has told you. This shows that there is something back of that. It shows that he is not dealing fairly with you. He does not want you to be where this will bring you. He does not want you to have what this will give you. He knows what this will do for you and not wanting it to be so. That is why he says, do not do that. His suggestions were taken. And as soon as they were entertained, she thought she now saw what before she did not see. And that which, in fact, was not true. As the Lord made them and intended they should remain, they were to receive all their instruction and all their knowledge from God. They were to listen to his word, to accept that word and allow it to guide them and to live in them. Thus, they would have the mind of God. They would think the thoughts of God by having his word expressive of his thoughts dwelling in them. But here, another mind, directly the opposite, was attended to. Other suggestions were accepted. Other thoughts were allowed. Other words were received, surrendered to, and obeyed, so that the woman saw that the tree was good for food. Was the tree good for food? No. But by listening to those words, she saw things that were not so. She saw things in a way that they were not seen before and never could have been seen in the light of God. But yielding to this other mind, she saw in a false saw things in a false light altogether. She saw that the tree was good for food and a tree to be desired to make one wise. It was no such thing. She saw it though. Now, this reminds me a little bit here of, uh, and I bring up again, Parminder, what he was teaching. Now, in one of my papers, I actually quote from this question and answer session that Parminder and the others did where Parminder talks about, where he's asked the question, should we accept what the leadership is telling us? Do we just have to believe what they say? Or can we study it out for ourselves? And Parminder says, and he, and he sets up a false, false dichotomy, I, either you believe everything they tell you, or you believe nothing they tell you. And of course, we know that they had truth mixed with error, a lot of error with some truth. Um, but he goes on to talk about how what we do, we need to do is submit to their instruction, to their view and understanding, because we can't understand things for ourselves. And when we look at everything that this movement has faced, what it faces is this conflict between the word of God and the word of man. And the word of God can speak to each one of us individually. Now, God does use people to expound the truth, to point us to the word of God, but never is man to interpose. In this sense, Satan is a medium, right? He is, he is trying to interpose between God and man. And that tree of the knowledge of good and evil um, represents all of the philosophies and ideas of man that are contrary to the word of God. And they can make us see things that are not so as if they are so. And all of us can fall under this deception. And so we need to understand how to avoid this deception. And this is really what Jones is presenting in this study from God's word. He goes on, this reveals the power of deception that there is in the words and the ways of Satan who made those suggestions at the time, as certainly as one inclines his mind that way, or as anything in his mind that would of itself incline that way. This gives Satan a chance to work and cause that person to see things in the wrong way. 
to cause him to see things as being the only necessary things, which um, are not true at all. And not only are they not necessary, but are absolutely false in every respect. Now, when we think about this, we often think about, well, doctrines and teachings. But what is the one thing that we need to see correctly that, that Satan does not want us to see? And this seems almost ironic based upon what the name Satan means. So what, is the, what does the name Satan mean? Oh, adversary. Yeah, so adversary or accuser, right? Yep. Right. So he accuses us. Now, you think, well, Satan is actually pointing out our sins, right? He's accusing us. But really, Satan is always accusing God. Now, in a direct sense, he accuses those who follow God falsely, right? Now, the Holy Spirit also shows us our sins, right? The Holy Spirit is the three-step process. It convicts of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So the Holy Spirit wants us to see our sins. He wants us to see our need and dependence upon God. Satan wants to discourage us, right? He wants to destroy our image and understanding of God so that God, we don't see God's power to justify, right? That we don't see his righteousness, his right doing in dealing with sin. So if we see ourselves as good, we know that we're under Satan's deception. Also, if we see ourselves as unsavable, that is, God is not going to save us, that is, it's not really our condition, it's the problem is with God, he can't save us, we also know we're under deception. And so because there's these two things, they're very, the path of error lies close to the path of truth or the track, uh, but they divert into opposite directions. So sometimes people get confused about these points that Jones is going to bring up, or what it means about our nature. Anyway, he goes on, when Eve saw all this, it was only the natural consequence. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Look at the record a little further. Eighth verse, and they heard the voice of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God. What was the cause of that? There was something about them that would avoid the presence of God, something that was not in harmony with God and caused them to hide themselves rather than to welcome him. So if we think of the idea that, that Jesus is the light and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil, we can see here that under Satan's deception, their problem is an understanding of God's character. They're seeking to hide from God. Where the gospel, even though it shows us our sin, it draws us to God. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Now the question, hast thou eaten of the tree, whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And he said, yes, I have. And I am inclined to think that it was not exactly right, and I am sorry. Did he? Oh, no. The question is, hast thou eaten of the tree, whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Hadst he eaten of it? Certainly he had. Why didn't he say Yes. As to that why, I will go a little further with the lesson and then ask this question again, and then we can all see why. He did not answer yes, though that is all the answer there was any room for. But he said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. It came in at last, admitting that he was involved in it. But whereabouts did he come in? The last possible place. The woman, even the Lord himself, must come in for the blame before the man could allow himself to come into it at all. In all this, he was simply saying, in substance, I would not have done it if 
it had not been for the woman because she gave it to me. And if the woman had not been here, she would not have done it. And if you had not put the woman here, she would not have been here. Therefore, if she had not been here, she would not have given it to me. And if she had not given it to me, I would not have done it. So, of course, as a matter of fact, I did eat, but the responsibility is back yonder. What was, what was it in him and about him that would lead him to involve everybody else in the universe before himself and before admitting that he had any part in it at all? Nothing but love of self, self-defense, self-protection. And the Lord said unto the woman, another clear question, what is this that thou hast done? And she said, oh, I took of the tree and I ate of it and I gave it to my husband and he ate it and it is too bad. No, she said no such thing. Mark, still answering the question, what is this that thou hast done? He did not ask who did it, but what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. She answered the question the same way that he did, that Adam did. The same thing caused her to dodge the question and involve somebody else that caused Adam to do that. Everybody else must come in but themselves. Now I ask, ask again, why did they not answer the straight question straight? They could not do it. And they could not do it because the mind with which they were actuated, which had taken possession of them, which held them in bondage and enslaved them under its power is the mind that originated in self-exaltation in the place of God and never will allow itself the second place, even where God is. We all know that that is the mind of Satan, of course. But back when he started, we know that the thing that caused him to reach the position where he stood at this time was exalting himself. He turned away his eyes from God and looked to himself, gave himself credit for great glory. And the place where he was was not large enough for him, and he must exalt himself. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. That was sin. The Lord called upon him to forsake his sin and his wrong course, to turn to God, to accept the ways of God once more. We know that it is so because it is written, God is no respecter of persons. There's no respect of persons with God. And as the heavenly family and the earthly family are all one family, as God is no respecter of persons. And as when man sinned, God gave him a second chance and called upon him to return. As certainly as there is no respect of persons with God, so certainly God gave to Lucifer a second chance and called upon him to return. That is settled. He might have forsaken his course. He might have forsaken himself and yielded to God. But instead of yielding, he refused that call, rejected God's gift, refused to turn from his ways and to surrender to God once more. And in that, he simply confirmed himself in spite of all that the Lord could do in that self-assertive course. And thus the mind which is in him thus confirmed in sin and rebellion against God, is enmity, not simply at enmity. It is enmity itself. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Now that mind was accepted by Adam and Eve, and being accepted by them, it took in the whole world, because they, in that acceptance, surrendered this world to Satan, and thus he became the God of this world. Accordingly, that is the mind of this world. That is the mind that controls the world. This mind of Satan. The mind of the God of this world. Is the mind that controls mankind. As mankind is in and of this world. And is in itself enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. Now that is why Adam and Eve could not answer that straight question straight. Men could answer that question straight now, but at that time they could not. For the reason that Satan had taken them under his dominion, and there was no other power to control them. 
His control was absolute. And there at that moment was total depravity. Now, Jones brings this in here because um, we know that the Catholic doctrine um, and, and often the Protestant doctrine is that there's this thing called total depravity. That is, even with everything that God can do in humanity, we cannot overcome sin. We will always be sinners. And this is why they give Jesus a sinless human nature, because if he had a sinful nature, he would be totally depraved. And so he, he couldn't have been our savior. But know what Jones says. He says, but God did not leave him there. He did not leave the race in that condition. He turns next and says to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Thus, there are two enmities in this world. One is from Satan and is enmity against God. The other is from God and is enmity against Satan. And through these two enmities come the two mysteries, the mystery of God and the mystery of iniquity. Now, um, this understanding that Jonah is, is presenting, presenting here is not accepted in Adventism. In a sense, Adventism, even though they don't use the term total depravity, they still believe that we are we, we are totally depraved. That is, if we have a fallen sinful nature that cannot be reconciled to God. That is, we can't be reconciled. And so Jones is going to address that. So we know that the mind of the flesh is enmity against God. But the Bible is clear that we can have a new mind. It doesn't get rid of the flesh, right? So we'll, we'll see this in this series of studies. This enmity against Satan is the righteousness of God, of course. In this saying, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. God broke the bond of Satan over the will of man, set, set man once more free to choose which authority he would follow, which king and which world he will have. In this word, God broke the absolute dominion of Satan and set the man free to choose which world he will have. And since that time, the man who will choose God's way and yield his will to the control of God can answer a straight question unto the Lord, so that when the Lord comes and asks, did you do so and so, he can answer yes, without bringing anybody else into it at all. This is confession of sin. And thus came the ability to confess sin and reveals the blessed truth that the power to confess sin repentance is the gift of God. This is the thing that we need most. We've talked about this a lot in many of our studies. It's easy to see the sins of others. It's harder to see our own sins, but even harder is to confess our sins without bringing anybody else into it, without blaming someone else. In fact, we go on in sin and justify what our actions are, our sinful actions are. We justify it because of the sinful actions of others. We think that we can justify our own actions, our own jealousy and envy and criticism and backbiting and gossip because, well, those other people are so bad. But the reality is, we are sinners. And repentance, the power to confess sin, is the gift of God. Now, the mind of Satan, being the mind of this world, um, and we reject, we're uh, uh, redirected or directed to uh, Matthew 7, verse 1 to 5. So we're going to go there. Judge not that ye be not judged. Now, of course, we know that the world just takes that judge not, right? They don't want us judging them. But it says, judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, ye, it shall be measured to you again. 
And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but con considerest not the beam that is thine in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold a beam in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Give not that which is holy unto dogs, neither, well, we'll just stop there. Now, this is an interesting point, because often when somebody criticizes us, we'll say to them, or we feel that they're criticizing us, they may just be convicting us, but we will say to them, oh, you need to take that beam out of, out of your own eye before you try to take the mote out of mine. But in so, do, in so doing, they're actually doing the very thing Jesus says you can't do. Because what we are to see is our own sin. Right? Now, to take a mote out of our brother's eye, by taking a beam out of our own, we actually can see our own sin more clearly. The beam causes us to not recognize where we are. And when we have that beam taken out of our eye, we can now see clearly to encourage and help those around us who are struggling instead of taking on the work of Satan in accusing and condemning and justifying ourselves. Jones goes on, he says, the mind of Satan being the mind of the world, the mind that controls the natural man is enmity with God and puts man at enmity with God. It cannot be reconciled to God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And the only thing to be done is to get it out of the way in some way. And if that can be done, then the man will be reconciled to God. Then the man is all right. He will once more be joined to God and God's word, God's thoughts, God's suggestions can reach him once more to be his guide and his all-controlling power. And as the thing cannot be reconciled to God, the only thing that can be done with it is to destroy it. Then, on, then only then, and by that means, can men be at peace with God and separate or separate from the world. And thank the Lord, he has given us the glad news that it is destroyed. As to how it is done and how we can benefit of it, that will come in other studies. I count it glad news that God sends us the, that the thing is done. Then, as to leading us into the benefit of it, the joy of it, the glory of it, and the power of it, that will be for the Lord to lead us. We know that, that this enmity, the mind of self and Satan, separated man from God, but God opened the way for man to return. The Lord gave man a chance to choose which world he will have. And this is the whole subject of our study. We are to leave this world if we are going to get out of Babylon at all. It was to give man a chance to choose which world that the Lord said to Satan, I will put enmity between thee and the seed of a woman. And therefore, the only and everlasting question is, which world? Which world? Which world shall a man choose? And when God in his wondrous mercy has opened the way and given us the power to choose a better world than this, why should there be any kind of hesitation? Turn to the second chapter of Ephesians, beginning with the first verse, and let us read the good news that the enmity against God is destroyed so that we may be free, beginning with the first verse. And you hath he quickened that is made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. We walked according to that spirit. What spirit is it that rules in the children of disobedience? The spirit that controls the world, the mind that originated the evil in the garden, and that is enmity against God. Who is the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience, the God of this world, was nothing in Jesus Christ. Thank the Lord. Among whom also we had our conversation, our way of life in, past, in times past, in the lusts 
of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. The mind of this world, being of this world, naturally falls into the ways of this world and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. We were. Before reading further in Ephesians, turn to Colossians 1.21. You were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind. Then where did the enmity lie that made us enmities? In the mind, the fleshly mind. The mind of the flesh is enmity, and it uh, controlling us makes us at enmity and enemies by wicked works. Now, I just want to call, um, comment on something that, that struck my mind as I was uh, listening to a, a message. Um, and one of the things, I don't know, because I've never tried to uh, tell anybody what, 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 what I understood, but the idea is that that when we participate in pay, participate in sin, we are actually in rebellion against God, which of course seems fairly obvious. But often we think about the fact that we're just sinning, and that we don't want to do the sin. So if we're struggling with sin, but what what we really are needing to recognize is that where that not only are we, um, and we have the mind of the flesh, that is, we're trying to overcome sin with the mind of the flesh, but we don't understand that in being at enmity with God, we are actually on the side of Satan in the great controversy. That when we sin, we are choosing to be on Satan's side against God. So it's not just us and God that somehow we are just sinning and you know we have this issue to deal with sins in our own lives but actually we are involved in a great controversy and we have chosen sides and i think that's something important to recognize it's not something i had thought about before i'm sure lots of you have thought about it i just haven't so we are at enmity that means we're on the side of the enemy of God. Now in Ephesians 2 11, wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by the Lord? No, but by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. Then there are some men in the flesh calling other men in the flesh certain names, making certain distinctions between themselves. And, and this is an important verse. I, I remember reading this the first time I read it. It really struck me. But anyway, um, Jones goes on. That at that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Another passage in connection with this is that in the fourth chapter, 17 and 18 verses which we will read before reading further here. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, that is, in the adultery, idolatry of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Those who are in the flesh, far off from God, are walking in the vanity of their mind, are alienated from God, and are separated from the life of God. Enemies in the mind, that is what we were. Reading again in Ephesians 2.13, but now, when? I mean that. I mean, we who are now here studying the scriptures, we are to yield ourselves to the word of God exactly as it is, that it may carry us where he may want us. Therefore, I ask, when? Now, right where we are. But now, in Jesus Christ, ye who, were sometime, ye who sometime were far off, far off from whom? Far off from God. Or far off from the Jews. The previous verse says, far off from God, without God. 
alienated from the life of God. Ye who sometime were far off from God are made nigh. To whom? To God or to the Jews? Nigh to God, of course. Ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh to God by the blood of Christ. For he, who is our peace, hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. That was between us. That was between us. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity. Thank the Lord. He hath abolished the enmity, and we can be separated from the world. Hath broken down the middle wall of partition between, between whom? Between men and God, surely. How did he do it? How did he break down the middle wall of partition between us and God by abolishing the enmity? Good. True, that enmity had worked a division and a separation between men on the earth between circumcision and uncircumcision, between circumcision according to the flesh and uncircumcision according to the flesh, it had manifested itself in their divisions in building up another wall between Jews, between Jew and Gentile, that is true. But if the Jews had been joined to God and had not been separated from him, would they have ever built up a wall between them and anybody else? No, certainly not. But in their separation from God, in their fleshly minds, in the enmity that was in their minds and the blindness through unbelief, which put the veil upon their heart, all this separated them from God. And then, because of the laws, the ceremonies which God had given them, they gave themselves credit for being the Lord's and for being so much better than other people but they built up a great separating wall and partition between themselves and other people. But where lay the root of the whole thing? As between them and other people, even. It lay at the enmity that was in them, and that separated them first from God. And being separated from him, the certain consequence was that they would be separated from others. Now, this brings us back to what Jones was talking about in... Uh, Genesis, uh, where he's talking about this total depravity, right? So men can't see uh, their situation. And then we see it where he's going to, after they have sinned, um, and God asks them these straight questions that they can't answer straight, it's going to be the gospel, right? In Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. So we know that the enmity here is, is God, Christ's righteousness. And this enmity is contrast to the enmity that is against God. But it also causes this enmity against the seed of the woman, which is, of course, Christ, but also those that have the mind of Christ, right? That's her seed and also thy seed because he's speaking to the serpent. That is those that have the mind of Satan. They're also going to be at enmity against each other. So there's a lot of enmity to go around. Uh, enmity against God can put us at enmity with those that are gods, but also just put us at enmity with anyone around us. But the enmity that God gives us can actually unite us with others, right? Because it unites us with God and, and it can break down those walls of partition. Um, Heidi and I are reading in five testimonies, a section right now that addresses the power of the gospel in our lives on how it can draw others to Christ. Doesn't mean everyone around us who sees us is going to be drawn to Christ or become, you know, Seventh-day Adventists or become converted. But there is something about living a Christian life that it can least bring conviction. It's going to bring light into people's lives and an opportunity for them to turn to God, to see themselves as they really are. Um, 
So again, uh, if the Jews had been joined to God and had not been separated from him, would they ever have built up a wall of, between them and anybody else? No, certainly not. But in their separation from God, in their fleshly minds, in the enmity that was in their minds, and the blindness through unbelief, which put the veil upon their heart, all this separated them from God. And then, because of the laws and the ceremonies God had given them, they gave themselves credit. And so that's the point that we often are comparing ourselves with others. We want to believe that we are good. And so we can take the truth and we can misuse it. So what lays at the root of the whole thing between them and other people even? It is the enmity that was in them that separated them first from God. So we need to be reconciled to God. Right? And that's what is, is going to say here. It says, for he is our peace who has made both one. Made both who one? God and men, certainly. And hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. For to make in himself of twain, of two, one new man, so making peace. Let us look at that, look that over again. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity. Now, omitting the next clause, we are not studying that in this lesson. What did he abolish that enmity for? What did he break down that middle wall of partition for? Why? For to make in himself of twain one new man. So making peace. Does Christ make a new man out of a Jew and a Gentile? No. Out of a heathen and somebody else? No. Out of one heathen and another heathen? No. God makes one new man out of God and man. And in Christ, God and man met so that they can be one. All men were separated from God. And in their separation from God, they were separated from one another. True, Christ wants to bring all to one another. He has ushered into the, he was ushered into the world with peace on earth, goodwill to man. That is his object. But does he spend his time in trying to get those, these reconciled to one another and in trying to destroy all these separations between men and to get them to say, oh, well, let all bygones be bygones. Now, will we bury uh, the hatchet now will we start up and turn over a new leaf and we will live better from this time on christ might have done that if he had taken that course there are thousands of people whom he could have persuaded to do that thousands whom he could persuade to say well it is too bad that we acted that way toward one another it is not right and i'm sorry for it and now let us all just leave that behind and turn over a new leaf and go on and do better he could have got people to agree to that but could they have stuck to it? No. For the wicked thing is there still that made the division. What caused the division? The enmity. Their separation from God caused the separation from one another. We need to keep that in mind all the time. And of course, we can't reconcile anyone else to God. We can only be reconciled to God. That's the only thing we have power over. Then what in the world? What's that? As I say, there's only two places in Scripture where you see partition. Okay. So, uh, First Kings six and Ephesians two fourteen. We just read. Okay. And um, so the partition in First Kings six. Um, Twenty one. Okay. 21. Yeah, so the, he made a partition by chains of gold before the oracle. Um, uh, you know, I don't know how that matches up with it or not. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I don't know. The thing is, you can see that this parti partition symbolizes the separation from God as well. So yeah. So that would be a, a point that we would look at there. Okay. <clears throat> So we know that what caused the division was the enmity. So, so then what in the world would have been the use of the Lord himself trying to get men to agree to put away their differences without going to the root of the matter? 
in getting rid of the enmity that caused the separation. Their separation from God had forced a separation from one another, was of necessity to destroy their separation from God. And this he did by abolishing the enmity. And we ministers can get a lesson from this. When churches call us to try to settle difficulties, we have nothing at all to do with settle, di settling difficulties between the men as such. We are to get the difficulty between God and man settled. And when that is done, all other separations will be ended. And I've seen this many times where they try to reconcile man to man without reconciling man to God. Right. Um, and this is, this is the problem, you know, I mean, we, we see in this movement, there's a separation, but the problem is our connection with God, not our connection with each other. It's not like we can read some books and try to understand other people's personalities and, and so forth. The problem is we're not connected to God. If we were connected to God, we wouldn't have these separations. And of course, we can always blame the other person. It's them that are not reconciled to God. We're fine. But we have no control over what they do. We only have control over what we do. And we are sinners. We're not reconciled to God. So 1 John 3, verse 8 to 18 one of my favorite chapters now <clears throat> so this is going to talk about um, that the the purpose of the son was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil that's verse eight and it talks about being born of god um, and that we need to love he that loveth not his brother does not know god so neither has seen god so the message that we've heard from the beginning, we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and slew his brother. And, therefore slew, and wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brothers righteous. Those that are righteous are not going to be persecuting the wicked. It's those that are wicked that persecute the righteous. And... Um, So there's more in that those verses, but we will continue here. Okay, where was I? We need to get the difficulty between God and man settled. And when that is done, all other separations will be ended. It is true that the Jews and their separation from God had built up extra separations between themselves and the Gentiles. It is true that Christ wanted to put all those separations out of the way, and he did do that. But the only way he did it, and the only way that he could do it, was to destroy the thing that separated them and God. All the separations between them and the Gentiles would be gone when the separation, the enmity between them and God was gone. Oh, the blessed news that the enmity is abolished. It is abolished, thank the Lord. There is therefore now no need whatever of our having any friendship with the world. No need of our having any lack of obedience to the law of God. No need of any failure to be subject to God. For Jesus Christ has taken the enmity out of the way. He has abolished it, destroyed it. He has destroyed the wicked thing in which lies friendship with the world, in which lies lack of lies lack of subject to God um, and failure to be subject to his law. It is gone. In Christ, it is gone. Not outside of Christ. In Christ, it is gone. Abolished and annihilated. Thank the Lord. This is freedom indeed. This Now, when he talks about in Christ, I'm just going to mention, I've mentioned it before. There's this idea of the in Christ motif that's running around Adventism or has been. And the idea is that everything's in Christ and we're not really a part of it. It's just in Christ. And so if we 
are in Christ, you know, we're righteous, but but we're not righteous, right? So we're still going to keep doing bad things in this in Christ motif idea. Everything was done in Christ. And so they try to take away this significance of what uh, Paul is saying and what Jones is saying here. When he says in Christ, it is gone. It doesn't mean that it's over there in the distance in Christ somewhere. We have to be in Christ. And if we are in Christ, it is gone in us, right? It can't just be gone in Christ and not in us. And and if it is just in Christ and not in us, then it's not going to benefit us. Because if it was just in Christ, then everyone could just be benefited by it. Everyone would be saved. Um, so Angela has directed us to a couple of things. Can you say what these things are about here? Because um, there's a rebuke to A.T. Jones. It's uh, March 23rd, 1906. Yeah, that's the MR. Yeah, that's the MR. I, was re- uh, I mean, the MS I, I was referring to. Okay, so it's Mary. before in 1906. Yeah, about the dissent. But she was mainly, yeah, she was mainly talking to A.T. A. T. Jones at that time. and. It's quite a rebuke, but it's, but it's a warning to, toward us, too. Yeah. Now, some people will point out, you know, Ellen White rebuked A.T. Jones. And, um, of course, they, they just take that out of context because Ellen White rebuked a lot of people. But Jones had a particular weakness. And Ellen White warned him of. And it's a weakness that all of us have, all of us need to guard against. And that is when, when the truth that we are presenting is opposed that we can take it personally. And and Jones did that. That's really what happened to Jones. After years of presenting the truth and facing the opposition, he succumbed to the idea that that he was personally hurt. I can understand that. Yeah, And, and, (laughs) and, 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 and you have to understand, he wanted to see the work finished, and yet there was this resistance to this truth and he just became impatient. I, I sort of liken it to uh, Moses, you know, striking the rock the second time. Right? Yeah, sounds like that. It's, it was an impatience on Jones' part. Now, part of it is, if you think about it, he believes he's in the Sunday law here in 1893, 1895. You know, and 20 years on down, you know, not 20, I guess it'd be like 10 years on down. Um, But even, you know, so we get like time has gone on and nothing is happening. The church is getting farther and farther away from the truth. It would be quite discouraging. And, And so, but Jones had these weaknesses that Ellen White warned him against. And Jones often, uh, listened to this council, but here in 1906, uh, this is sort of, Jones is going off. There's this whole controversy dealing with, with Kellogg and, um, and, the, and the ministers, the conflict with Kellogg, that Jones gets caught up in. And it's one of the things that leads to his downfall. Um, so we know that in Christ, it is gone, abolished, annihilated. Thank the Lord, this is freedom indeed. That has always been good news, of course. But to me now, in view of the situation which God has shown us as we are now placed in this world. This blessed news has come to me in the last few days as though I'd never heard it before. It has come to me bringing such joy, such genuine Christian delight that, well, it seems to me I'm just as happy as a Christian. Oh, the blessed fact that God says that thing which separates us from God, which joins us to the world, and which does all the mischief, is abolished in him who is our peace. Let us take the glad news tonight. Rejoice in it all the night and all the day that God may lead us further and further into the green pastures and by the still waters of his glorious kingdom into which he has translated us. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you, unto me, I know, is born this day in the city of David, a savior, which is Christ the Lord. Thank the Lord. 
So, so a very powerful message. Now, as he, he said, he's going to go on further in these studies and talk about how this becomes a part of our, our experience. And that's going to be tied up in understanding the nature of Christ and what it means to have the mind of Christ. So, but you can see how po important this point is and how this point is often neglected. I mean, you don't see it actually presented very often at all in the way that Jones has presented it. So um, it's past 8.30, so let's, unless somebody has a comment, can help tie this together, let's uh, close with prayer. Okay. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study and for the Sabbath. We just pray for your presence as we continue to listen to your word, to study it, to obey it. And we pray for one another, Lord, for people in this movement. We know that there's truths that you have given us, and we pray that we can respond to the light that shines into our darkness, and that we can obey the truth, and that you can empower us to live a Christian life. Bless each person, be with them on the Sabbath, Help them with their needs. Uh, we pray for those that are struggling. We know there's people in this message that have abject poverty, that are seeking to find the truth. We ask that you can send them angels, that you can provide for them, that they can seek you and that they can be victorious in the trials that you've given them. Help each of us with our trials to see the things in ourselves that are lacking. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name.